The sermon this afternoon is on the teaching of the Word of God concerning the Ninth Commandment. The Ninth Commandment, which is, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. We have an exposition of this in the Heidelberg Catechism in Lord's Day 43, page 557 in the Book of Praise. So we'll read that together. Lord's Day 43, what is required in the ninth commandment? I must not give false testimony against anyone. Twist no one's words, not gossip or slander, nor condemn or join in condemning anyone rashly and unheard. Rather, I must avoid all lying and deceit as the devil's own works under penalty of God's heavy wrath. In court and everywhere else, I must love the truth, speak and confess it honestly, and do what I can to defend and promote my neighbor's honor and reputation. After the sermon, we will sing in response to the gospel, hymn 70, stanzas 1, 2, 3, and 4. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, there is an old myth. Well, I don't know how old myths can be in American culture since the country is only a couple hundred years old, but as far as that goes, there is a, an old myth in American culture about highly trained soldiers and martial artists, right, people who have attained black belts in kung fu or karate or, or things like that, people who are professional prize fighters. The myth is that their bodies are considered to be legal, deadly weapons. And because of that, if they were to get into a brawl with anyone, then they can get into serious trouble for, for using what is legally considered a deadly weapon. Now, it's not true. This is a myth that was the result of publicity stunts in the boxing world where prize fighters, when promoting the fight, they would, you know, sort of jokingly have their, their fists uh, registered as deadly weapons. The truth is, if you attain a black belt or if you're trained as a soldier, you do not need to legally register your hands or your feet as deadly weapons. There's nothing true about any of that. But every single one of you here was born with a deadly weapon, and that is your tongue. We read in Proverbs 28, or 25, verse 18, a man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a war club or a sword or a sharp arrow. Bearing false witness can be deadly. It can cause the end of someone's life. Bearing false witness can be as deadly as any weapon of war. And now, before continuing, I want to be very clear that throughout the sermon, when referring to the tongue, this is the stand-in for every kind of use of words that there is. Even somebody who, in fact, is born without a physical tongue, someone who is unable to, you know, audibly speak with their mouths, they are still capable of the same things through other means, you know, writing or sign language or sharing destructive material, things like that. So the tongue, when we're talking about the tongue here tonight, we're talking about communication in every possible form. 
In the tongue, in communication, human beings have a very powerful weapon. It's built right into us. It has great power. It has power to destroy, even kill, but also and with the help of our God. With the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, it also has the amazing power to build up as it was designed to do. So in the ninth commandment, we are instructed because of this to guard our tongues because of the power that they wield. So our theme this afternoon, the ninth commandment, guard your tongue. We'll see two aspects of this. First of all, that the tongue can easily destroy But secondly, that its purpose is to build up. First of all, the tongue can easily destroy. That verse from Proverbs 25 that we just read, a man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a war club or a sword or a sharp arrow. A deadly weapon. Is this an exaggeration? Or is it really true that you have that same deadly ability built into you? This is certainly not an exaggeration. This isn't poetic, you know, hyperbole. This is not an exaggeration. There are a number of explicit examples of things like this uh, in God's Word. Do you remember the story of, of Naboth? In 1 Kings 21, that's one of, the, one of the most familiar episodes of the destructive qualities of, uh, false, of bearing false witness, right? The story is, he had a vineyard, King Ahab wanted it, King Ahab's wife Jezebel said, I'll get it for you, so she hired two false witnesses to testify that they heard Naboth curse God and the king. And what happened because of that? Naboth lost his life. Naboth was executed. And Ahab took the vineyard. The words of the witnesses, they're just words. The words of the witnesses were the weapons that ended Naboth's life. Think of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. False witnesses came forward against Jesus Christ to accuse him of blasphemy and cause his sentence of execution that brought him to the cross. False witnesses came forward against Stephen in in Acts to accuse him of blasphemy too. And for that, Stephen was stoned to death. Words caused the end of people's lives. How often do we hear stories in in our modern world about injustices being perpetrated? Innocent people being framed for crimes. There's corruption in law enforcement. There's corruption in politics. Think of the lies that are that are just flung about in the political realm. People do not care one bit about what actually is true and what is false. The only thing that matters is is winning. This is not an exaggeration. The words can destroy. They can be deadly. They can easily cause so much death and destruction. As I was going over some previous notes of work on Lord's Day 43, I found this example that I had shared a couple of years ago. And what a powerful example this is. There was a story of a, of a young man who was very troubled and depressed. He was suicidal. And he had a friend that he confided in. And he admitted to this friend that he had attempted to commit suicide a number of times. And this friend, how did she use her speech? In order to comfort him or to encourage him to seek help so that he might be built up and be well? No. She went the other way. She prodded him and and pushed him 
with text messages. And she goaded him into going through with his suicide, telling him even that he would be a failure if he chickened out again. She convinced him to asphyxiate himself. And even when halfway through he decided that he wanted to live, she convinced him otherwise and pressured him into going through with it, all with text messages. And she was charged with murder for her part that she played in his death. That is the destructive power of words. That is what we're capable of with our mouths. They can have power over someone's very life. We can destroy with our lips, with our tongues. The book of Jeremiah, from which we read a little while ago, it's quite a, a special book in a, in a certain respect in that it, it contains, like other books of the Bible, contains accusations or judgments of, of God against his people. They contain, it contains descriptions of their unfaithfulness toward them. And what's quite special and unique about Jeremiah is that these indictments that God levels against his people, they seem to follow the pattern of the Ten Commandments. And the pattern that, or, and the section that we read together describes in such color the way that God is so displeased with his own people because of how polluted they were in their lying and deception in regards to the ninth commandment. These are the people of God that are being described here. God's people, what do they do? Verse 3, they bend their tongues like a bow. What does that mean? It's, it's like they're preparing their tongues for destruction. It's like bending a bow for what purpose? In order to release an arrow to, to kill someone. They prepare their tongues to, to hurt, to harm, to destroy, to kill. Still verse 3, falsehood has grown strong in the land. They don't want truth. Verses 4 and 5, Let everyone beware of his neighbor and put no trust in any brother, for every brother is a deceiver, and every neighbor goes about as a slanderer. Everyone deceives his neighbor, and no one speaks the truth. Verse 8, With his mouth each speaks peace to his neighbor, but in his heart he plans an ambush for them. These are God's people. And God is not exaggerating in this accusation. This is what God's people are doing to each other. Let everyone beware of his neighbor. Wow. That's what life in the, in the family of God, the household of God is? Could you imagine becoming a member of a church and being cautioned as a member of the church. Now be careful. Don't trust anybody here. Don't trust anyone. People are out to get you, and you can't really believe what they're saying. There's always an ulterior motive, and they're going to try to get one over on you. What devastation. This was the case for the kingdom of Judah and the Lord was going to judge them for this. This is what is alive in the human heart. That is what we all have within us according to our sinful nature. And that's no exaggeration. This is what we're capable of. Really causing serious harm with our words. We've all been guilty of this in, in certain ways. It's probably not the case that any of us have uttered words that have actually resulted in, in, the, in death like Naboth or, or Stephen. But our words have harmed. They have brought harm. Can you think of instances where you spoke to someone or 
maybe more commonly, spoke about someone in a way that certainly hurt them, in a way that damaged their reputation, that broke them down, even if it was just in the eyes of, of one person. It's a dangerous thing. James 3, verses 7 through 10. In case we think we are not in danger of this. James 3, 7 to 10. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed. Every, every creature can be tamed. And has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. James isn't writing about some uncivilized, you know, godless group of people. He, he's lumping himself in with the Christians that he's writing to. He's writing to people of God, people who, who have faith in Jesus Christ, who are forgiven of their sins, but who now must wrestle against that old nature that must be put to death. The evil nature that clings to us is so warped, it's so warped, that this is it's, it seems unthinkable that this is something that we actually have to fight against. We read these indictments, we hear these indictments in, in Jeremiah about the way that people deal against each other. And we clutch our pearls. Oh, this is what's in our hearts by nature. We have to wrestle against this. Our inclination, the sinful inclination is to hurt others. And if we are not on guard against this, why did James write this? To warn us to be on guard because we are susceptible to this. If we are not on guard for this, then we, we are endangering the well-being of the people that we love the people that God has put in our lives. The tongue can just get away from us. It can happen without any effort at all. It just happens. It can so easily destroy. But that is not what God has designed it for. God created this, the tongue. God created this incredible thing, language, where we can share our ideas. Ideas can be transferred from one person's brain into another's so that you can share a thought. How wild is that? God designed this. What a beautiful thing. He gave the gift of the tongue. He gave the gift of communication for the purpose of building up, for the purpose of blessing and encouraging one another. That's our second point. On the one hand, this, speaking about the deadly, you know, dangers of the tongue and the, and the sort of destruction that, that it wields, it can put us in a bit of a state of, of unease, knowing what kind of firepower we wield. We are so, you know, deadly. We have the potential to be so deadly, to cause so much destruction, but... We give thanks to God that he has taught us that we are actually able to flee from this and we are actually able to hate this sort of thing with our whole heart. Remember, we're, we're hearing these commandments, the commandments of God. They appear in the, in the third part of the catechism that deals with our life of thankfulness. We have this commandment before us in 
a very optimistic light. Why? Because Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, so all of the sins that we have committed against, against this commandment, all the ways that we've slandered each other, you know, whispered about a friend, about, about someone, and, and wrecked the reputation, all of the ways that we've done that, we've been forgiven those things. Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, also renews us by his Holy Spirit to be his image, so that with our whole life we may show ourselves thankful to God for his benefits, and he may be praised by us. This is what we ought to do with the ninth commandment. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we are able to have a beginning, a good beginning of this. We can live according to this now. The Holy Spirit of Christ has been given to us to make us detest these things that we heard, the atrocious things that human beings can do to each other. Detest that. Hate it. Hate gossiping. Hate the idea of harming another person with our words. And we can really rejoice in the right use of our tongues, promoting each other's well-being. Right? In court and everywhere else, where else, I must love the truth, speak and confess it honestly, and do what I can to defend and promote my neighbor's honor and reputation. We can have joy in doing this. There are really wonderful tasks that our tongues have. Ephesians 4, verse 29 let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Our words can improve our friends, our neighbors, our brothers and sisters, the people that we go to church with. We can strengthen each other. Colossians 3, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. This is what our tongues are for. Celebrating the goodness of God together. Correcting and encouraging each other. That's why we spend time together, right? That's why we have fellowship together, so that we can do this for one another. That's why congregational life is so important. Instead of coming to church and, and, and being here for a little bit and then just dispersing and leading your own lives without having anything to do with each other. No, we need to live our lives together. Doing things that seem trivial, you know, like, like barbecues and picnics and, and things like that, you know, fundraisers, like wh whatever it is. Who cares about the event? It serves the purpose of people of God spending time together talking Talk to each other. That's why you have a tongue. So that you can spend time together and build each other up. There's so much joy and satisfaction and fullness in, in that. In spending time together talking praying, singing, using our language to be a blessing to each other. And the effects are immediate. I remember so fondly, um, a couple of years ago, I was able to go on a class trip. It was the, the famous Jarvis uh, camping trip. And... 
we had only been here for a couple of years by that point, didn't really know a lot of people, but we were able to spend time after all the kids were in their tents. Maybe the kids aren't, don't realize this, but the adults sometimes stay up until about two or three in the morning around the fire talking. And what a blessing that is. The fellowship that is there, sharing struggles, sharing the kinds of sadness that you have experienced, sharing lessons that you had learned, sharing the ways that God had been so gracious to, to each person, praying together and with words, being able to encourage each other and build each other up. What there, Loving relationships are, are forged through that kind of talking together. It can be so fun and enjoyable to, to, to tell stories, right? To share remarkable and memorable stories, whatever they are, work stories, fishing stories, stories about funny things your kids did. Infinitely more. How much more of a joy it is and how much the blessing multiplies and how much joy multiplies to recount stories of God. There was the man in Mark 5. He had that legion of demons. And the Lord Jesus Christ cast them out of this man. And he, he was so overjoyed. And he wanted to go and be a disciple of Christ and follow him everywhere. And, and the Lord Jesus Christ said, no, no, no. You go back to your home. Go back to your village and tell everyone the mercy that the Lord has had on you. This is what we must be doing with each other. Tell each other the mercy the Lord has had on you. This builds the body of Christ. It knits us together in profound ways. These are the kinds of things that happen when you spend time in each other's homes, when you visit each other, when someone is sick, when someone is needy, when someone is sad, and when you pray together and sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to the praise of God the Father, this is how God calls you to use your tongues. Remind each other daily of the goodness of God Spend time with your brothers and sisters that God has given you responsibility over, over the other one here. Consider how to build up the body of Christ with your words, with your speech, with what you may write, with what you may text, with a note that you might leave in someone's mailbox. It doesn't have to be a big thing. Not like, it doesn't have to be leading the Bible study or, or something like that. Not everybody is, is okay with that and suited to that. But even quietly, one-on-one, -on -one, over coffee or something, remind each other of how good God is to us through Christ. Pray together. With one another. For one another. What a building is built through this edifying work. Building the temple of God himself. Amen.